What is up, guys, and welcome to another episode of Guarani Vision, the first ever podcast dedicated to Paraguayan football in English. As always, I'm Robert Rojas, and joining me is my great co-host, Ralph Hanna, and here we are, another episode, another day, another week of Paraguayan football. We're already heading in towards the end of April. You know, we're obviously really going into the the nitty-gritty of what is the Copa Libertadores and the Sudamericana. We're going to talk about what Paraguayan teams' chances are still alive, Some or, or even some teams that are just falling by the wayside and feel like they're their season in, in international competitions is over. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about more about some good side and a bad side of a Paraguayan going on in, in South Beach. We'll talk about what's been going on there. But Ralph, I mean, uh, it's been kind of a, a quiet week, you would say, in terms of what's been going on in, in Paraguayan football as a whole. I mean, yeah, we've had some transfers. We've had some, you know, sad news. And obviously, we've had some football along the way. But it's been kind of a quiet week, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. It sometimes feels that way. I Hi everybody that's uh, watching and listening. It's because the league is is just kind of rumbling along as we, as we've been talking about last week. You know, teams uh, Libertad one, Cerro one, so nothing's really changing in that kind of that kind of respect. And then with the with the games we saw this week, it was a packed schedule, right, of, of Libertadores and Sudamericana. Um, but again, I don't think we saw as we'll talk about. I don't think we saw too many surprises. Maybe we. Maybe with with Libertad, we might have hoped for a little bit more, but but ultimately we're starting to see things that we're, we're expecting. But it has been a good week overall, right, for the Paraguayan teams because you saw finally uh, Trinidense and Emiliano getting off the off the mark and getting some points, which is going to be a huge financial boost for them as well in the Copa Sudamericana. So it's it's been a positive week, and we've also got the under twenties, the girls. Um, that won their opening game against Ecuador, which is which is kind of uh, key. Was it Ecuador? Am I saying that right? Yeah. Venezuela. Venezuela. Yeah, I, I've said that twice now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, against Venezuela, and and that's you know putting them very close to the World Cup in Colombia. So it, it has been a positive week, but like you say, it's just kind of been rumbling along with with everything as as we get to this this kind of time of year. Yeah, and obviously heading into the next month, you know, we're obviously going to be right towards like the the break of the Copa Libertadores, Sudamericana, the break of the league. The European seasons are coming to an end, and that means going straight into the international season. And obviously, what's been going on with Paraguay? They're going to participate in the Copa America and the Olympics. And obviously, we have some something to talk about that. Hopefully, in the next few weeks, about you know some players that might go in, some players that might not go in. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. But let's start at what's been going on in the Copa Libertadores. We'll talk about what happened actually last night because it's still fresh in our memory. I think it was kind of the the heavyweight clash of the week for the Paraguayan teams. It was Cerro Porteño hosting Fluminense, the defending champions of the Copa Libertadores at La Nueva Oya. It was really a, a must win for, for Cerro because given the chance of how the group has been setting up in a way, it kind of felt like getting the result and the three points would have helped them in a in a huge situation. I think they would have won. They would have been top of the group if they won, but unfortunately they didn't. They ended in a nil, nil draw, which, you know, depending on what side of the, 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 the fan base you are, it might be a positive result. It might be a negative result because of how Fluminense were going into this game. They had some losses uh, due to some indisciplinary action action. So it's been kind of a, a strange result. We saw Manolo Jimenez saying that he was, you know, happy with the draw, but he felt like, you know, there wasn't any doubt that they could have gone for the win. And they did, you know, Ralph, just looking at the game, you know, looking at the highlights, they had a few chances. I think they really set up themselves well. And, you know, rightly so, I think, understandably, they they wanted to be as defensive as possible against what is the toughest team in uh, South America, not just in Brazil, but, you know, as the reigning champions. But you would think that you're playing at home. It's a It's a situation where you feel as if, though, in those scenarios – you need to get the win and and at in this point maximum points because that's what helps the group and especially the way that it's set up feels like it needs uh Cedro only had that chance right there but ultimately i mean Cedro are still in it they're still in it and right now as we speak uh after the Colo Colo nil nil draw against Alianza Lima Fluminense are top with 5 points Colo Colo are in second with 4 points but only one goal separates both of them um obviously between the Colo Colo scoring twice and the goals against but obviously, Colo Colo would win the head-to-head between them and Cerro Porteño, who are currently in third with four points, and Alianza Lima with, sec- with two points. So they're still alive in this competition, Ralph. Yeah, yeah, still alive. And it's kind of, I mean, it, it's funny, right, that the way you're talking about the fan base, that suddenly people wanted Cerro to, to beat Fluminense, <laughs> which, 
I don't know. Looking back when they when they lose that opener at the last minute to Colo Colo, you weren't really expecting that. And and we talked about it last week, right? We we really knowing what we've seen from Manolo so far, his tendency is always going to be to set up more defensively, and he, it was a very defensive lineup as as we expected. He brought actually it was interesting. He played Iturbe and Cecilio Dominguez for the first time in a while that those two have started. Um, his plans were scuppered a little bit with the Morel injury early on, so Morel is the most defensive of defensive midfielders. He's even played center back before he gets injured. And I think Will Viera has to come on, but it didn't really change the, the idea. Um, I think Serra ended with like 27% possession, which tells it, tells its story. Interestingly, they, they had more shots on target than Fluminense, but I think both teams, if you look at the XG, it's like below half a goal. So it, it was really at no point looking particularly like, one team was was going to win or, or was deserving of a win, right? I mean, there there were a couple of good saves by uh, by Fabio, but but ultimately, I think the the nil nil draw was was what was the plan from Cerro, what they set up for, and 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 uh, what we saw. Uh, for it's really interesting to, just talking about the defense because that Colo Colo goal in the stoppage time that's the last time Cerro have. Uh, conceded from open play. Since then, they've only conceded one goal, which was a penalty against Trinidense. So they've they've really improved defensively. And I think usually when a new manager comes in, this is maybe the best way to start, right? Build the base, build the foundation, and then you can go from there. And in the league, they they've been they've been actually fairly free scoring in the last few games. I think they've got multiple goals, two or three in the last three games, maybe. So so ultimately. It, it seems to be working this this situation, and for the match itself, it, it's fine. The point works. They'll probably lose in Brazil if we're honest, and then they need to win their last two games, and it's and it's in their hands because if they beat Colo Colo, then of course that whole that whole idea of the head to head is is wiped out, and and they have their chance of going forward. Yeah, I think it's it's ultimately something that I think looking back. It might be a wasted chance. I mean, obviously, now looking ahead to what they have to play now, they have to go to Lima. They have to travel to Rio de Janeiro afterwards. So you have back-to-back away games for Cerro Porteño, where you feel as if, though, one of the games is definitely winnable. I think the way that we've seen from Alianza Lima, they haven't demonstrated that they can indeed compete in this competition, let alone try to go and qualify out of the latter stages. So it's getting the result there, and I think winning there would probably be the best scenario for them because, obviously... Say they lose the game against Fluminense away, then they have the final game against Colo Colo, kind of the team that kind of beat them on the first day. That kind of helps them in a way, looking at how the group sets up. It could favor in Cerro Porteño's hands of qualifying to the round of 16, which I think ultimately they want that. Like they do want that kind of stuff. I mean, I understand there is that kind of like level of apathy towards going to the Sudamericana because it's easier, which I don't think looking at how the way the group has been in the competition, it definitely is. And so you just play the way that you want and, and you go for what it is. Yes, they have been definitely um, harmed with some really tricky draws in the past. I think that's certainly something that no one can can argue. But ultimately, I think it's that consistency that allows you to get better and ultimately try to to move on. And of course, it's a huge financial boost for them as well. Yeah, yeah. And the financial point is key, Roberto, because the idea that fans say that, oh, you're tanking for the Sudamericana, and that's very much, I think, from the fans' perspective, from from the management side, you want to be in the Copa Libertadores because the the money is much better. And like you say, the Sudamericana is not particularly easy, so it doesn't mean just because you finish third eh, and you go to the Sudamericana, you're go- you're gonna have like an easy run to a final or anything like that. So I'm sure the goal is definitely to to continue to qualify through the. The Libertadores. And yeah, I think the group's been really strange because like you mentioned, they could have gone top with a win and it's because every, there has been a lot of draws and there have been teams taking points where maybe you didn't expect. So, so maybe we didn't expect Alianza Lima to to hold Colo Colo, but then at the same time we haven't expected Fluminense to drop as many points. You know, they've, they've only won one game at the halfway stage. So the, there's, the group is, is finely balanced, I think, because of that. The teams are taking points off each other and it and it does it sets up well for for Cerro I think to have a chance to to get through into the next round 
half of the half of the group stage results have been draws by the way three six games three of them have been draws so yeah it's kind of really open as it is for them and then looking at the other group of the other Paraguayan team participating in the Copa Libertadores we have Libertad who hosted River Plate at the Defensores del Chaco over there obviously a, a big scenario for a lot of River Plate fans it was a big game for them in terms of their chances to qualify they started off pretty well. They were unlucky to concede that goal from Solari in the 34th minute. And then Espino, Espinosa, you know, someone who came in actually uh, as a off the bench, getting the equalizer. But then ultimately it was Mastradono getting the goal, the youngster from Argentina, scoring in the 80th minute to give all three points to to River Plate. And Libertad are still in a tricky situation because Nacional did win as well. They beat Deportivo Tachira, which means River Plate are still unbeaten with nine points. They look like they're going to qualify for the round of 16. But it's that Nacional result that kind of is kind of hurting them in a way for Libertad. They have six points where Libertad have three in the Copa Sudamericana stage and then Deportivo Tachira in last with three losses to their name. They have to go to San Cristobal. They have to go to Buenos Aires now, Libertad, and then they'll host it against Nacional. So in a similar stage to what Cerro Bordeño are kind of into, they look into that last game as kind of the vital game that puts them into a into a spot to qualify for the round of 16. But for Leroy Thad's case, I think, yeah, they didn't get the result that they wanted. I think they ultimately could have felt happier with the draw, um, even a win if they wanted to. But I think ultimately they'll feel a bit definitely uh, disappointed that they couldn't get all three points at the Defensores the other day. Yeah, I think so. And the the, the Defensores is, has always been a, a tricky spot for them in the Libertadores compared to playing in La Huerta, the, the home stadium, which is much smaller and they have this fantastic record there. But the issue is River Plate, of course, such a big club. They came, there was lots of fans. It was, it was a, you know, it was a big traveling contingent that came over to, to Asuncion. So the game gets hosted in the national stadium. Um, and there we saw, we saw Libertad kind of at, at times take the game the way they wanted to. But, but really they, you know, they, they just weren't good enough defensively, I think, because Although the Solari goal is is a bit lucky, I think over on the balance on the balance of the game, kind of River Plate created enough to to have won the match. Um, the Espinosa is interesting, right? So so Mati Espinosa, often a left back, he came on for Melgarejo, who got injured, who plays more as a as a left sided forward. And and after the game, Espinosa was saying, "Well, actually, I started out as a winger, so I'm I'm kind of used to to doing this." And and he was he was kind of happy to play in that position and, and get a really well taken goal. And then right, the the surprise with the winner comes from I think it's the youngest player to ever score for River in the Copa Libertadores when all this focus is on uh, Echeverri, who's who's this like young star, but then they have another player that comes through and, and kind of ruins it for, for Libertad. Uh about the group, I mean you said the last game against Nacional is key. But it does depend a lot on what they do in San Cristobal because they they traditionally Libertad have not been very good in Venezuela. This year, the Venezuelan teams in general have been really poor across the the competition. We'll talk probably about Zuliano and, and Emiliano soon. Um, and Tachira is another team. They've only scored one goal in, in these three games so far. They've lost every game. But that game for Libertad is so important because if they don't pick up the three points there, then, then the difference with Nacional is going to be too much because I'm assuming Nacional will win their game against Tachira. So, it's uh, yeah, it's still it's still something, you know, it's it's still something in the balance. But I think very similar to Cerro, yeah, it could come down to this home game, last match, and and do the business at home. I assume they'll be in La Huerta for that game against Nacional, and so there, I think they have a better chance to to get all three points. Yeah, I mean, it's a similar stage, you know, obviously the next game that they play are against the bottom team of the group, you know, playing away and then obviously away to what is the toughest team, you know, Fluminense with Cerro and Libertad um, with River Play. And then, yeah, then against the team to that they're kind of fighting for that last spot to qualify with Nacional and Colo Colo respectively. I mean, yeah, we'll we'll have to wait and see what happens because I think it's certainly going to be a, a topic of discussion and certainly the game away will be the vital one. I think that's the one where they need to... For both teams, if they can get the win, I think that puts them in a better spot. Let's see what they can do in Rio de Janeiro and Buenos Aires, respectively. But I think the first game, the next game that they play away in uh, in Lima and in San Cristobal will kind of help them 
moving forward as we switch gears to what's been going on in the Copa Sudamericana. Because, yes, we've gotten some results there. We saw, obviously, some teams get some results that, in a way, kind of felt uh, needed. It was Sportivo Trinidense getting the 2-0 win over Nacional Potosí. You know, a huge boost for them. And given the way that the group has been, Ralph, Fortaleza beat Boca Juniors uh, last night as well. 4-2, they have to play Boca at home again. Uh, then they have to travel to Potosí, go to Bolivia, and then finishing it off with Fortaleza. The way that the group is set up, Fortaleza with nine points, three wins. They, they look like they're going to go into the round of 16. But it's still open for them, for Trinidense and Boca Juniors. I mean, not only would this be huge for them to qualify to the knockout round playoffs, because for them it'd be a huge boost for them financially, given it's their first ever competition, but to do it at the disposal of Boca Juniors, the team that made it to the final of the Copa Libertadores last year, I mean, that would be, it'd be a huge shock. It'd be a huge shock. And honestly, I probably would not take it away from them from not being able to do it. I think they, they have a real good chance. It would be a big shock. I mean, for, firstly, with this game, it was, yeah, it was like a, a must win at home to the Bolivian side. And and they got the job done. And, and it was nice to see players like uh, Juan Sancedo, who's been really good, I think. He's, he's very technically gifted. There in in midfield, and and he got that second goal, which was really well taken. Um, and they pushed Boca, right? They pushed Boca in the game against the Boma, uh, in the Bombonera, when Boca had a pretty strong side. In that case, the difference, obviously, with last night with the Boca losing to Fortaleza, is they put all their subs pretty much. They put almost a B team because of what's going on in Argentina domestically, and and they've had the Clasico and they got through, and so they have big games coming up, but. I would assume they've learned their lesson from from that quite embarrassing defeat to to Fortaleza because it's it's very rare Boca concede four goals in in international competition. So you'd expect a stronger team to show up in in Asuncion. Um, but yeah, I mean the way that Trinidense pushed them in in the bottom there and definitely gives them some hope. It would be it would be an incredible story to see the that team do well and the manager. Remember Jose Arrua is not. Not that old. He's mid thirties. This is his first, I would say, major job, right? With, with a team in Primera. I think he's only he had only managed in lower division before then. Uh, so for him to be able to to pull off something like that would be huge. Regardless, this win is is a big moment. We've we've talked about the prize money. The prize money is so important for these smaller Paraguayan clubs. Is this is pretty much like uh, more than they would win in a year in in any prize money or TV money and in Paraguay domestically. So it's just so big to to get those three points, but also the, I think it's like, I don't know if it's $300,000 or it's 100,000 in so many kind of, it's just, it's just great money for them. And, and that really sets them up and and makes them, I think, start thinking about, we want to be in the so many kind of again next year. Because if you yeah, look at think... in the league at the moment, they're not doing particularly well because they've had to pretty much decide what, where are we going to, put more of our playing resource and playing time. But now it, it might make them think, well, we, we want to be here again and we'll have a bit of money to invest from from this year. Because what they didn't do when they're in the Libertadores, in the qualifiers, they didn't invest big because they didn't want to risk it. So they didn't bring in like a big name signing or anything like that. But, but now they might be tempted, I think, with having a bit of a base financially to do something. But first they have to get back to the Sudamericana and, and improve their league form. Absolutely. And I think looking ahead to that, I think that allows them to help them in a good spot, similar to what Ameliano are doing, because Portillo and Ameliano are also kind of not in the worst scenarios either. They also have, uh, they've got the win as well, away in this case. They went all the way to Caracas and beat Rayo Suyagano 4-0. And if I remember, Ralph, I think there was only one fan from Sportivo Ameliano that went to this game? No, I think it, there were a few of them in the end, but there's one diehard fan. Who, who I know who goes to every game is called Silvio Sens. He's an ex-player. So he played for them back in the 80s when they were really were like a, an amateur team. Because remember, Emiliano's history has always been not just in the second division, it's been even lower, like in the in the third or almost regional. The regionals as well, yeah. Yeah. Um, so he's a huge fan. And I, I, there were a few of them there because when I watched the, I didn't watch this game live, but when I watched the highlights, uh, you could hear the goals being cheered because <laughs> Zuliano... <laughs> Are not from Zuliano is from Zulia, right? So it's a different province. They're, they're not from Caracas, but for whatever reason, they're they're playing there. Um, 
and they didn't have many home fans at all. So when the goals went in, you could actually hear some cheers. I think there was a good group of about 10, 10, 15 of them, I assume, went on the charter with the with the team. Um, and that was a that's a great experience for for Emiliano. And like you say, it's again, there's the financial boost, but again, it's the, the that little bit of hope that maybe there's something they could they could try and do and and uh you know, make a surprise maybe and and, and sneak into one of the uh, second place positions to get into the playoffs. Yeah, they have to play Danubio, the team that's kind of really battling it out in the next game before taking on Rayo Sui. Zuliano uh, back at the Defensores and then finishing it off in Curitiba against Atletico Paranaense. So they're they're in a good spot. Two back-to-back home games. And ultimately, I think if they're able to get maximum points in both of them, assuming what uh, Paranaense are doing, they're they're still unbeaten. Similar, <laughs> It's kind of a similar path that we're seeing with these Paraguayan teams, kind of hoping on the big teams getting the results and then battling out with the other teams um, to go and qualify. So, yeah, it's it's good for, for them, don't you think? For both Amediano and, and Trinidad, we'll go to the Nash team, we'll go to the last team in a bit. But for them, being in this scenario is something that they wanted. They definitely didn't want. They didn't want to be in this situation after three games where they were down and out for the count, but they were, they were that they were still alive in this competition. Yeah, right. They they also kept themselves alive by winning by four goals because they had lost five zero to to Baranaense, so they had to get. They had to get their goal difference something similar to to Danubio, which is what they've done now. Um, so I think the again, yeah, it's kind of in their hands, right? It's going to be the Danubio game, so similar to Cerro and, and Libertad. I mean, it's it's is exciting for them, and I think with Emiliano specifically, they don't have the same. They're not having the same issues in the league as Trinidense. So I think they feel they're probably in a better position as well to take on these these last two. Well, I say last two games, last two home games, right, or that they have, mm-hmm. which are going to be the big ones. Now, two teams who are kind of bigger names that have obviously been important in Paraguayan football have not shown up in this competition because we're going to talk about Nacional first. Nacional of uh, Mario Redo, obviously, they t- took on Racing of, of Uruguay in a really a must win because they were coming off two straight losses, the loss against Argentinos Juniors and then the 4-0 loss to Corinthians. And they were in a good spot. They were winning 2-1 at one point, but then obviously Racing uh, equalized in the 78th minute. And yeah, after three games, uh, Ralph, one point, not a single win for them at the moment. Corinthians with four points above them, Racing with five, and then Argentinos Jr. is leading the way with six. I think it's the end of the road for these guys, don't you think? Yeah, I think it's been difficult for Nacional because, well, similar to Trinidense, because they had the Libertadores qualification, so they had those sort of extra games they've been playing for so long now things have not worked out in the league they they changed their manager just before their their debut in the Sudamericana that hasn't really worked out either for them because results aren't aren't changing aren't picking up I think they have like one win in this season maybe or they have yes. one win in the last few something like that know. yeah and, they, and what we're seeing now is they started to change things up so Gustavo Caballero's has come back into the fold. He scores the first goal. Yeah, he also had a good game at the at the weekend. He's he's like a difficult winger to to kind of handle. Um, and then, but then people like Diego Duarte, he was back in for this, but he hasn't been playing as regularly. So that uh, because he's been playing Thiago Caballero, so like things have changed a lot uh, in the forward line as they try and figure out what works. But at the same time, they've had all these defensive problems so much this season and it kind of haunted them again in this match against against Racing because they, they were ahead twice and they didn't end up taking the, the points. So I think with looking at who else is, is in the group and what's to come with them having to play Corinthians and Argentinos Juniors again, yeah, I can't see Nacional getting out of here. And they also do want to focus on the on the league because they've been doing so badly as they as they put all their resources into this. And the team that's been doing probably the worst Paraguayan team in the comp- in the two competitions so far is Sportivo Luqueño because they obviously traveled to Braganza Paulista to take on Red Bull Ragantino and they couldn't get the result that they needed. It was a 2-1 loss. 
And now they go into the situation with zero points, not a single win so far, only one goal scored. That was their first goal that they scored in three games, Ralph. Now they have to obviously deal with Coquimbo Unido, who are obviously ahead of them with three points in third place. Red Bull Bagantino, the defensor de Chaco, who are with six points uh, in the second place. And then the team that have still haven't lost and they have to go to Avellaneda to finish it off is Racing Blue with obviously the top spot with nine points. So as bad as Nacional's career, uh, journey has been so far for uh, Cureluque, it's been even worse for them. Yeah, yeah. It, it has been worse, but I still have a little bit of hope in the sense that they have the two home games um, coming up against against teams that, that maybe they could beat. I mean, against Coquimbo, they will definitely want to, to win that home game. And I think that's been the key result so far, right? Losing to Racing is... It, it was it was disappointing. I remember that game. It, it was disappointing, kind of the level of performance. But ultimately, you know, it's still resting. Losing away in Brazil to Bragantino is not is not the worst result. But I think that when they slipped up to Coquimbo and they lost that game one one zero, that's maybe what what could have tipped the balance to have a possibility to qualify. But that said, with the with two home games left, you still wonder could they pull something off you think maybe Bragantino they'll be qualified I guess by the time they come to Paraguay so they might not come with their team well actually it's still in the balance <laughs> yeah I'm just looking now Ooh. okay so it might be it might be tough yeah I, I think it might be tough because to beat Bragantino full team we've even seen teams like Libertad struggle with that so I think it could be could be a, a bridge too far for Lukenio but yeah I, hopefully they get that Coquimbo result at home and we start to see them picking up because of all the teams. If you remember when we talked about this in the preview, I think both Fede and I, we were definitely the most excited about Lucenio, about thinking they're they're probably the best team with the squad that they have and also with the with the coach. Um, but it just hasn't worked out for them so far. It hasn't. Well, let's let's go into it at, in a bigger path, I guess. And then I'll, I'll pose the question to you and I'll even answer it myself. I guess on a scale to one to ten, one being the lowest odds and ten being the highest uh, odds. How confident, and we'll go in order for Cerro Porteño first, how confident are you that they can qualify to the round of 16? I personally give them a seven because I think that they can get a result against Alianza Lima. I think they, that winning would help them tremendously and then getting that final game against Colo Colo at home. I think that's going to boost their chances. So right now, I'll, I'll put the, I'll put a seven that they'll qualify. All right. Uh, the rankings. Yeah. Yeah. I think seven is good because definitely, definitely I'd have them over 50%. So I'll get, I'll give them a seven as well. I, I feel that they're in a pretty good position after last night's draw. Libertad, they have to go to Tachira. They have to, sorry, they have to go to San Cristobal, take on Tachira. Then they have to go to Buenos Aires and then finish it out with Nacional. Honestly, I'll give them a five to qualify for the round of 16, but I think I'd give them a, a eight to go to the Sudamericana if worse comes to worse. Okay. Yeah. I see that. I see that. Yeah. I think, I think I wouldn't want to give them as high as Cerro because, like I said, I think they've struggled in Venezuela. Nacional are playing really well this, this year. I've been impressed with Nacional when I see them. So it's, it's a harder run in than Cerro have. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give them a six, just so I'm not copying you, but definitely not <laughs> as good a chance as Cerro. Trinidense, this is a tough one. This is a really tough one because I, I really want to hope for them. And, you know, this can't be as bad as a Volca side that one would think. So I'll give them, um, to qualify for the knockout rounds to play off, by the way, I don't think they'll, they'll make the round of 16. I, I'll say, I'll give them a five. I'll give them a five. Oh, okay. It's a 50 50 chance. All right. Mm. Um, no, I it's, think just, it's been a bad it's been a bad Boca side personally, but That's I just true. think That's you never know. I think with Gina then say I'll give them a three. It's it still be a miracle if they if they get through because they're gonna. They're, I'm just looking at this now as we talk. They're probably gonna lose to Fortaleza, Potosi. They have to go to to the Altura, right? So they have to yeah. go high up. Yeah, I think it's a three. It's still a miracle if they pull it off. Sportivo Emiliano, they're obviously tied with Danubio at the moment, but it's obviously a big gap between them and Rayo Suiliano. Um I'll give them... I mean, the, the game against Danubio is the big one. I think if they win that one, then their odds get increasingly bigger. So I'll say... I'll say a six. I'll give them a six. Nice, yeah. Yeah, I'm around there. I'll, I'll give them a five. I think it's, 
it's definitely in the balance. I think it's it's fifty fifty based on that result, right? If they if they beat the Nubia, then it's they're in a great position. And then but that game itself is not is not easy. So yeah, I'll give them a five. They're they're in there. 50-50. I'll make this as straightforward as possible. I'll give Nacional a one because they have a point, and I'll give Sportivo Chinense a zero because uh, I don't see Lucanio. any of these teams, Lucanio, getting a chance to, to qualify. So that's my pick. I don't know if you have any increased hope out of that. I'll give I'll give uh, Nacional a one and Lucanio a two because I used to live in Lucanio. Ah, uh, uh, there you go. Always got to be but biased I, on that I end. Think, <laughs> yeah, I still think the home, they're very good at home traditionally. They I know they didn't be racing, but but traditionally, they have been good in in so many kind of home. So it's going to be a big home. week. It's going to be a big week for a lot of these teams. I'm really looking forward to it. Obviously, a lot of situations coming into play, and yeah, looking forward to see what happens between now and then. And looking at what's going to happen in the future. Now, switching gears to here stateside, we obviously had some news, some sad news. We'll start with the sad news first, obviously, because obviously we saw uh inter Miami playing this weekend against Nashville, and we saw unfortunately Diego Gomez suffering an injury. From a, a I, I guess he was trying to attempt a cross, Ralph, and he, he got it injured. But according to his doc, the, the Paraguay national team medical doctor, Dr. Osvaldo Isfran, he announced that he suffered a grade three sprained ankle um, and that involved some ligament damage. And yeah, for what we've told from him, that he'll be out at a minimum four to six weeks, which is it's a big blow for Inter Miami because he's been playing so well, but also I think uh, a big blow of what's going to happen to him in terms of morale and. Yeah, just cutting right close to that Copa America, which is starting in, you know, less than two months. Um, there is that fear that he could indeed miss it and probably not be at 100%. But knowing him, perhaps he'll make it. I don't know. It's a, it's a big call, you know, because it's never tricky. It's never easy to get these type of injuries very close to, to tournament time. Yeah, it's, we, we, I feel like we've been so unlucky with injuries, right? So our key players, talking about the national team, because we've had Almiro now, we've had Julian Cesar, who did come back, but he didn't play. Ramon uh, Sosa, who actually scored on the weekend, is who scored the other day as well, but he's been injured for quite some time. Yeah, exactly. Ramon Sosa, thank, thankfully, came back and and is doing well. But yeah, we just keep seeing this. So uh, Diego Gomez is the latest. It's it's like you say, it's, it's a really like tricky time frame because let's say it does extend to six weeks, he's he'll be back just in time, pretty much for the friendlies, the pre. The pre-game friendly. So, I mean, if I was Garnero, I'd, I'd take him and then just have to see how he does in those friendlies and I hope it's enough to, to take him to the Copa America. This is actually great news that Paraguay did organize three friendlies now, thinking about it, because it will, it will give him some, some extra like opportunities for minutes. But then you must have in the back of your mind, maybe not Garnero because he's focused on one thing, but as Paraguay as a whole, you're thinking of the Olympics. So then it makes you think, oh, wouldn't it be better just to let him come back in, not play Copa America and go to the Olympics because it gives him more recovery time. I think if, if the Olympics didn't exist, then it's, the Copa America is definitely happening. You'd, you'd want to take him. You'd risk everything, right? Because you need him for that. But with the Olympics, it's just like, oh, maybe why don't we give him that extra? It's an extra month pretty much, right? Or yeah. an extra six weeks almost. So oh, should we give him that extra time? So it's... I don't know. It's a tricky one, but but the first thing is he has to get back on, back into training, back on the pitch. So so let's hope he recovers well. And this also comes into play, I think, around the same time as well that it was announced. It's not official, but you know, from, coming from rumblings of Paraguayan media, that we have another naturalized player, another nationalized player in Franco Cristallo of Gremio, a 27 year old Argentine who's been playing very well at Gremio as of recently. He obviously plays with with Matias Villasanti over there in uh, in Porto Alegre. And he kind of plays in a similar role. He's, he's the number 10. He's an attacking midfielder. So, And there had been, obviously, the news that not only is he nationalized just because he wants to play for Paraguay, but because Dani Garnero is going to bring him for the Copa America. And, yeah, I mean, if this comes in a worst-case scenario for Diego Gomez and he does miss out, there's your replacement. There's a, there's a replacement because Garnero refuses to play with Kako. Kaku Romero, right? Because Kaku is just who just made the who just made to the Champions League final. Yeah, I just saw exactly. that. Exactly, <laughs> the AFC Champions League final, right? But uh, but uh, no, it's a different style. I, I I appreciate that. It's a different style of player. Um, but we've seen this before, I think, with with some managers, particularly the Argentinian managers who know those players very well from from having coached there previously, and then finding out that there is some kind of link with 
with Paraguay and wanting to to bring them in. And this is a really real surprise, right? Because we talked about we've talked about a few possible players that could have been could have been nationalized before, and and Cristaldo had never come up until this week. So it's it's one of those kind of surprise ones. But like you say, that the, if it's a twenty seven year old, they're not currently playing in Paraguay or have like a specific link to Paraguay. It's obviously Garnero's kind of feeling that he what he thinks this player can do a job and and wants to use him. I don't think it, they would just get him nationalized for no reason. So so it would be interesting, right, to to see this and see if it works. Um, it just takes me back to I think it's Berisa, right? Berisa was the one who brought in Gaston Jimenez, and that was meant to be like his key player. He was really going to try and build around uh, around Gaston, and it, it never worked out for us. But but this could be this could be a similar situation, and especially like you say with the Gomez injury. Well, one player that obviously will get some attention in Miami uh, that actually was announced, I think, a couple of days after this this injury was announced officially is Matias Rojas. Matias Rojas is officially signed for. Uh, Inter Miami, obviously a, a name that kind of had been made some rumblings, I think, in the last two months. But there were some issues of obviously some delays with Corinthians and trying to sort out his contract. But now it's official. Now it's official. And more so, I think I just saw right here uh, some news that it appears that Matias Rojas will travel with the squad. He's already gotten a, a warm welcome from Jordi Alba, from Lino Messi. I don't know if you've been seeing it on social media, but he's gotten a warm welcome as of now. And, you know, certainly this could be someone that... Could indeed play. He's making the trip to to New England here near near my neck of the woods, playing uh, the New England Revolution at Gillette Stadium. Obviously, a big game for for them as they continue to still be in a good spot in in the league. So, yeah, for for all the attention given to Diego Gomez as a player that you know unfortunately had you know gotten this injury at a wrong time and had been playing so well, now it's Matias Rojas' time to to shine and see what he can prove because. He certainly needs that uh, in order to to break into a, a squad that is obviously going to contend on all levels. Yeah, a, a former product of Cerro Porteño, left-footed. They have good records in MLS, right? Talking being about coached by Tata Martino, Martino as well. Being coached by yeah, Tata Martino as well. Being coached by Tata Martino, there you go. So we've got all the vibes. Um, I mean, the thing about Mati Rojas is he was he's one of those players that he, he was having a really good period with, with Racing. Then it was his time to kind of make a make a move. I don't know if he made the right move going to Corinthians. Well, now it's easy with hindsight saying he didn't make the right move, but not because they we didn't realize what was going to happen with the financial situation that he wasn't getting paid, and that's kind of why. And he got injured as well. And he got injured yeah. as well. Dude. And then he got injured just at that time. Um, but I think now is a, is a really good place for him to be because one, you're surrounded by great players, of course. But two, for all the demands of the MLS in terms of the travel and the minutes, he's not going to be subject to that because I think the plan is for him to to pretty much relieve Messi. Um, I think that's that's what I'm hearing. So it's going to be to use him sparingly. He's not going to have to play so many minutes like somebody like Gomez. And I think that's for a player of his type that kind of works quite well. He's he's you know he's he's a lot of quality and technical and creative. He, he's not. He's not necessarily a player you want to see running up and down for for ninety minutes. As that's just never been his style. So I think this will fit quite well. What I'm assuming are, are going to be the demands for him, and it's it's up to him to take the opportunity, right, and stay fit. As we keep talking about injuries, uh, to stay fit and and take a great opportunity there. Yeah, and I, I think you know to close it out. I feel as if though for Diego Gomez, you know, he's coming on really good form and he's been playing so well. But to get this injury right before also the transfer window, I mean, obviously there had been some rumors of him being linked to a move, and yeah, just hope that it's such an injury like this, if he does return, and, and you know, if he does play the Copa America and does well there, that kind of accelerates a bit of his of his development to hopefully do well and yeah, maybe move on towards a better team in the future. Yeah, there's a. The, I think with with this kind of injury, thankfully, it's not it's not as serious as we first thought, right? When we saw him getting stretched off, so I don't think it would affect too many transfer transfer plans. But there is always that thing of when when somebody suffers any kind of injury, you want to see how they respond. So so maybe the the Copa America becomes even more important for Gomez. But but he's been showing his his quality, and and I'm pretty sure he's still young. That when he comes back. We're going to see that that same kind of player. He's he's really is. I think at the moment, if we're talking about transfers just quickly, like Diego Gomez and Ramon Sosa, 
are these two real stars at the moment that we're surprised maybe to see this side of the world and we could end up seeing over in, in Europe uh, for the start of next season. Absolutely. So we'll have to wait and see what happens there. We'll see what happens to Mati Rojas in MLS. And we'll see what happens to a lot of these Paraguayan teams as we close out another great episode of Guarani Vision for myself, Roberto Rojas, and Ralph Hanna. Thank you so much for listening in. See you soon.